Good morning. Glad to see y'all as we get ready to worship this morning on this surprisingly wet Sunday morning. Glad y'all could make it through the rain to be here. I'm going to invite you to pull out your In the Life of the Church insert while you're doing that. Good morning to all of you who are dry and at home on watching us on Facebook. We are really glad that you're joining us as well and hope you're having a great Sunday morning. Okay, just a few things to point out to you before we get underway with worship. Uh, first, we are trying to have a monthly time of fellowship at Grader's Ice Cream on Sundays uh, throughout the summer. And so that's this Sunday. So, uh, so after the worship service, uh, we will be gathering for those who are up for ice cream over at Grader's right here in the Grader's Kenwood. So about 12, 15-ish, I'll see you over there and we will enjoy some ice cream before you head out to lunch because I say have dessert first. Uh, so hope you can join us for the Grader's Ice Cream Fellowship after worship. And then, uh, again, Presbyterians like food. Uh, so our Munch Bunch Fellowship group is getting together this Thursday. That's a monthly fellowship group that gets together on Thursdays. And so this month's gathering is at Stone Creek at 1130. Donna Higdon would love to bend your ear about that if you are interested in the Thursday Munch Bunch. So she's right there. You can talk with her about that. Next week, we have a very special opportunity. My friend and mentor, Bob Ronglein, is going to be with us. He is the uh, fellow, you've heard me talk about him before. He's a scholar, he's an archaeologist, Bible teacher. Uh, he is the one that facilitated the pilgrimage to the, to the Holy Land that I took about four or five years ago. Uh, maybe more than that now, time flies. Uh, he is a fantastic teacher. Uh, he let me know that he was going to be in town next weekend for a family wedding and said, hey, Russ, is there anything I can do to encourage the folks at Madeira Silverwood? And I said, yes. So he's going to come and do some teaching for us between the two worship services. And so I encourage you, do not miss this opportunity. Bob is a terrific teacher. Uh, he's going to be teaching about the, the, the new family of God that Jesus is creating. And he will be teaching down in the chapel. So I know it's, a, it's early for y'all to come at 10 o'clock, but I tr I, you know, believe me, I don't think you will be disappointed. Please come and join us at 10 for this great teaching opportunity next week. And then finally, next week is also the conclusion of our Life Forward campaign, our mission partners at Life Forward. We, we collect um, funds for them. Uh, we give you baby bottles. You can fill them up with a loose change or loose bills as, or checks, as the case may be. And uh, we'll be bringing those back in next week to dedicate. And so if you haven't brought, brought it back yet, bring that in next week and we'll have a, a prayer of dedication. Also, um, we have a crib out in the entry foyer. If you want to bring diapers, for Life Forward. It's a crisis pregnancy center helping uh, young, young women and young mothers who are in need. So if you want to bring diapers for that, you can put that in the um, crib out there. We'll be dedicating those as well next week. All the rest you can take a look at at your leisure, but brothers and sisters, we are here to worship and to turn our hearts and minds once again to Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. And so I invite you now as, as we get ready to uh, worship, as we join our voices on this hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, a hymn talking all about how God shaped us for one another, let this music lift your hearts and minds to contemplate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and contemplate the connection that we have as the body of Christ. Let's stand, let's join our voices together on our opening hymn, number 393, Blessed be the tie that binds.
be seated. God's promises are for all generations. The word of God is near to us. Let us turn to our Lord in prayer. That which was broken to proclaim your vision of a world made new, creating us new hearts and strong voices as we pray together. Lord, we thank you for all those in scripture who have pointed Christ to toward Christ for the prophets, the apostles, and the early Christian men and women. We thank you too for those whose lives have pointed us to Christ, pastors, teachers, strangers, friends, especially we lift up those who volunteered this past week for Vacation Bible School, that we too may point the children and others to Christ, the light of the world. You rule the ways of people and govern all earthly governments. Work with those who work for peace, bring peace and goodwill among all people. Fill us with your spirit that we may celebrate your victory and your glory and worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Christ our Lord, who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. In contrast to God's clear word, our faults and failings may remain hidden from others and even from ourselves. Confession before God can clear our eyes and cleanse our hearts, for God's mercy is as wide as the firmament of heaven. Let us confess our sins to the one who gives life eternal. Let us pray. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, the Lord has done great things for us. We do not receive the spirit, we have received the spirit of adoption. We have been made guilt-free because of the forgiveness and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. For you are God's beloved children, forgiven, loved, and freed. Be know, know that you are forgiven in Christ's name. In his name, amen. seated. So this week was our vacation Bible school and what a astounding experience it was. Ordinarily I would invite Missy Hardy to be up here and orient us to this. Uh, however, Missy this morning, very early this morning, got on a bus with some of the youth from our youth group and they are at Montreat for a youth, uh, a, a youth retreat this week. So Missy has been on the move. She is putting in all kinds of time, energy, and effort. So when she gets back, give her a big atta girl. She has just done some extraordinary work. But this week's va Vacation Bible School, huge success. We had 
50 volunteers, we had 77 participants, and even though we didn't have uh, our usual participants from our mission partners at West Cincinnati, unfortunately due to a scheduling conflict, they were not able to participate this year. We look forward to having them back next year. But e even without them here, we had a great turnout with those 77 participants. They, the, the theme was Hero Hotline. It was imagining a, 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 a call center to help superheroes. And we learned that heroes are called to follow Jesus, to help each other, to work together, to listen to God, and to show grace. And the children learned this through Bible stories, through songs, through the, the work of our dedicated volunteers, helping them with crafts that helped cement these Bible stories in their brains. It was really astounding. I, I, and so I'd like to, uh, you see a number of folks wearing red shirts. If you volunteered with VBS, I'm going to invite you to stand right now. In Star Trek world, red shirts are not great, but they're great here. So huzzah to all of our, yeah, yeah. I say volunteers, you're ministers. You are ministers and, and agents of the Holy Spirit. So thank you all for what you did. You also see this mountain of shoes that we have here. The mission project that VBS did this year was with Souls for Souls, and it's an organization that takes these shoes, gets them, them to people in need all around the world. Uh, Stephen was praying about this morning uh, in the early service, 128 countries? 128 countries, five distribution centers. Uh, it's astounding, the, the work that Souls for Souls does. And so we have collected, as, well, as of 2 o'clock on Friday, we had 659 pairs of shoes. <laughs> and I see that there are more in the bin, so I'm going to count those up and add them to our pile. Stephen. Thank you so much, Stephen. To summarize, for those of you who are joining online and probably could not hear uh, via the microphone, Stephen was talking about the ministry. You're getting thumbs up. They could hear? Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, Stephen was talking about the ministry of Souls for Souls. Children around the world can't go to school without shoes. People can't go to, uh, to, to, to work without shoes. And, and, and these shoes will also provide uh, micro enterprise opportunities for people to have the dignity of, of work. So it's a truly extraordinary organization. I do encourage you to look them up online. We've got a link on our website on the page where it's about Souls for, for Souls and our shoe campaign, and you can learn more about Souls for Souls there. So uh, we've had some astounding stuff done through Vacation Bible School. Seeds of faith have been planted. Children have been pointed to the Lord. I think among all our volunteers, you know, we, our, our ministers, we have been encouraged in our faith and drawn closer together uh, through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I'm gonna invite M Morris, uh, Morris the puppet master, Morris the, you know, who, 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 who does such amazing work making a, a puppet uh, leader come to life, and, and these children just go bananas over these puppet characters that, that, that Morris uh, brings to life. I'm going to ask Morris if he can offer a prayer of dedication for our shoes and for the work and the seeds of faith that were sowed this week. Morris. The kids didn't know who the puppet master was. I tried to slip in and out of the little stage there without them knowing some learned. But they did. So we have a, a lot of pair of shoes here. Let us dedicate these shoes. Let us pray. Precious Lord, you are concerned about us from head to foot. 
And these shoes can be a blessing for many people around the world. We would pray that each pair would bless a, a pair of feet. They would be able to attend school or to work and just to be safe. Because some places even it's not safe to be barefoot in the world. There's disease that can be attributed. We pray that they would bless those people with education, with work, and just a self-image of being better. Use them to show your love to people around the world, we pray in Christ's holy name. Amen. Many people brought them in, not only the children, but the staff and even the community brought them in. And we're reminded that, e that each one of our offerings is essential to the life and the well-being of the whole body of Christ. So as we prepare to receive our tithes and offerings this morning, I would remind you that what little bit you can do can be a blessing and be multiplied in God's kingdom. If the ushers will come forward, we would receive the morning tithes and offerings.
Gracious Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to share the gifts that you have given us with others. Breathe on these gifts that we bring, that they may bring life to feed, to strengthen, and to bless our world through Christ our Lord, as we are your ambassadors and minister in your name. Bless those who give back to you and to give to others. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We welcome you. Not yet. Just a minute. I got to pass the peace. <laughs> we welcome you, uh, those here in the building, as well as those who greet us on Facebook, that we are sharing God's love together. May we take a moment to greet those around and share the peace of Christ with each other. God bless and Christ's peace be with you. Amen. And as everyone's settling down and getting ready to sing the hymn, so you might as well stand back up again. So all of us here extend to all of you online the peace of Christ. May the peace of Christ be and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Okay, there again, you're sitting back down. Roy has given you the clue. Yes, here we go. The people standing up. So Roy was raring to go for this next hymn, so... Why don't you start us in our next hymn, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart.
Today's scripture reading comes from the book of the 1 Corinthians, chapter 12, 12 through 26. Hear the word of the Lord. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are, are unpresentable are treated with spe special modesty, while our, our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. This is the word of the Lord. May God add his blessing to the reading and to the proclamation of his word. Amen. So we continue through our series, uh, God Helps the Lonely Heart. And if you haven't been with us for this series, we, we're, we're addressing what the Surgeon General identified as a loneliness epidemic and just trying to bring some biblical and theological truth to help us understand and grasp how how we as Christians can deal with and navigate loneliness. Loneliness is a feeling that comes upon us. Feelings come and go. And uh, I'm, I'm not promising that you will never feel lonely again, but rather I'm promising that biblical truth helps take the edge off of loneliness, helps us get through it, and helps us reframe things in, 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 in a different way. And the early part of the series, we talked a lot about some truths, some transcendent truths, that as we think about these truths and pray about these truths, uh, they, they, they can help us with the reframing. So we talked about you know, the idea we're not made to be alone, that when we slip into loneliness, we can just think this is all there is. And no, we're not made for that. We talked about the idea of we have a, a transcendent home, a place prepared for us, a place where we are received and loved and cherished in, in our heavenly home, and that truth affects how we live today, you know, that sense of security that, uh, that we do have a place. For the past couple of weeks, we talked about the idea of, of God as a trinity. God as a trinity and a community in God's own person. Relationship is a part of God's character. And through the grace of Christ, we're invited in to partake of that community. And that truth gives us some strength. Now, with this message, we're going to turn our focus a little bit. The next three messages are all going to deal about the people that God provide for, provides for us. Uh, if, if we internalize these truths, we discover there's already people in our lives 
God has providentially provided people in our families, friends, people in church. And those relationships can help take the edge off of loneliness. If we've learned our identity and who we are, we can more adequately receive the people that God has already placed in our lives. And so this message kind of cues that up and, and, and prepares us with the idea that God gives us other people as we face the idea of loneliness, just knowing God has provided other people in our lives. And so with all that preamble, let's just dig right in. Now, the first thing I want you to notice, um, this passage from 1 Corinthians, it's, it's talking about how God provides these other people. It's talking specifically about the church. So the theme is about the church. So take a look with me at the first two verses. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. So, so, so just as we get into this, I want you to understand, yes, this passage is specifically talking about the church. It's talking about how God, through grace, provides the Holy Spirit and, and draws us together as a church. However, what I am doing in, in our time together today is taking the general relationship principles of this passage and applying it to all the relationships that we have, church or not. So, so while this is specifically pointed to the church, we're trying to abstract some, some basic relationship principles uh, about that. So you can always apply this to the church. I'm just gonna be coming back to the church in another message and we'll zero in on the church later. Today, we're just looking for general relationship principles. Okay, with all that said, let's take a look at some of these principles. And the first one I want you to notice is the idea that we are interconnected. We cannot escape interconnectedness. And we saw earlier, you're not made to be alone, but beyond not made to be alone, we can't escape that we affect and shape one another. Take a look at verses 15 and 16. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being a part of the body. You know, we have this myth of the rugged individual, this myth of the, of the self-made man. There's no self-made people. You all had help. We all had help. You, you ever seen that sign you drive past a school? If you can read this, thank a teacher. We've all had people that have invested in us, shaped us, mentored us, shown kindness to us, and helped us become the people that we are. Yeah. But this interconnectedness goes beyond that. It just goes to the idea that we cannot help but affect one another. Just being in proximity with one another we affect one another, we shape one another. Even when we're not thinking about it, we affect one another, we shape one another, we have impact on one another. That's the idea. You know, you can't say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not really having any impact on anybody. No, you are, and you shape and affect people. You know, psychologist uh, Murray Bowen uh, created the field of family systems theory. Fascinating theory that I've, I've read up on a little bit. And uh, Bowen had started, was early in his career, he was working in a, a you know, mental ward, um, a mental health ward, and trying to deal with some people that were just going through some incredible crisis and, and just were in deep, deep pain. And as he sat with them and tried to understand what was going on, um, you know, at that time, the, the world of mental health was simply focusing on the patient. It, it tended to be a lot of a, a administration of, of medical intervention therapy only and, and you know, not really seeing a lot of results. He was listening to this person and, re, and decided to try something different of meeting with the whole family, of, of, of encountering the whole family. And, and what he found, his theory was that uh, that a, an individual's emotional functioning 
is nestled within a family. He even went so far as to say the family is the basic emotional unit. And the, the, the roles that you have within your family and the way that you pass your anxieties along to one another and manage emotions and relationships is all the family. And, and, and so we pass anxiety around, we, we build one another up, some people highly functioning, some people lowly functioning, but it's all nestled in the family. And, and he found that as he helped people work within an emotional system healthily, the whole system improved, the whole family improved. And, and so he developed this idea of family systems theory. It has um, worked its way into business thinking, many, many businesses think in, in terms of emotional systems and, and how does that work. Churches, uh, a lot of churches, uh, I've discovered this through some, some church pastoral training that, that I've received, the idea of the church as a, an emotional unit, a family, all of it talking about the way that we affect one another in an emotional system without even realizing it without even realizing how we affect and shape one another. One of the things that Bowen talks about, it's just a, a lovely concept, he says that a, a healthy functioning person within a system, he, had, he calls it the, the non-anxious presence. I love that. The, the idea of you're present, you're connected, but you're not anxious. You're managing your emotions well. You're not passing your 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 anger, your, your hurt, your anxiety off on other people to manage. You're managing it well yourself. And, and he lifts this up. It, you know, it's, you're dealing with your own stuff would be a way uh, of talking about it. It's kind of what Jesus talks about when Jesus says, why do you look at the log in, or the splinter in somebody else's eye? Deal with the log in your own eye first. It's, it's that kind of idea. And, and which made me think of you, you may be familiar with Stephen Covey's work. And he has this wonderful way of talking about things. He talks about the circle of control, the circle of influence, and the circle of concern. The circle of control are the things you can actually control. Your thoughts. Your behaviors. The way you respond. The way you show up in a given situation. Circle of concern are all those things... You've got no control over, but that keep you up at night. Russia, the economy, the weather, how, you know, how somebody else, what, what is somebody else going to do? You worry about all these things, but you've got no control over them. And what Covey says is if you focus on these things out here in cons uh, of concern that you've got no control over, your influence over events and life shrinks. Because you're going around, going around, oh, what's going to happen here? And, and, and the people in your family system, they have to manage around you. And, and you, you lose influence over them because they're having to manage you and manage how they respond to your own anxiety. If you focus on the things you can control, my behaviors, how do I show up? Am I dispensing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, all this fruit of the Spirit? If I'm growing in those things, your influence expands because you then begin to support and be strength for other people. The point behind all of this is that we affect one another. Even when we don't realize it, even if we are just sitting there on our couch worrying, we're affecting other people. Or even if we're just sitting there on our couch spending time in prayer and giving ourselves unto the Lord, you're affecting other people because that's shaping your inner world and that has a cascading in impact. So whether we acknowledge it or not, you cannot say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body. Whether we acknowledge or, or not, what you do, how you show up, affects everybody you come in contact with. Now, moving along from that, the, the deeper implication of that is that you have a distinctive contribution. 
Because as, as you were doing all this stuff, you've been shaped by God. Carry on. Um, let's just pick up at verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just where he wanted them to be. And if they were all one part, where would the body be? As it, were, as it is, there are many parts, but one body. God has arranged the parts. And I think that's, that's such an important comfort in this as we think about this idea of we're in this, these interrelated systems of relationships where everything we do affects somebody. That could be paralyzing, but then we realize God's the one who designed it all. God in his providence ordered and orchestrated all those relationships. You are quite literally God's gift to one another. You are God's gift. And God has given you something distinctive that nobody else has to offer to give to other people. In the same way, every single person that you encounter is God's gift to you and has something distinctive and unique for you. I mean, what would it be like going into any given situation just with a sense of openness, openness uh, you know, through the power of the Spirit? Okay, God, I don't know what you have for me in this conversation, but you clearly got something. Instead of being you know, consumed with criticisms, just simply being open, what gift do you have? And in the same way, in any given conversation, just being open, what blessing do I have to offer? It could be something uh, based in your gifts, in your wisdom, in your insight and intelligence. It could just be something simple as a listening ear, an insightful question to go a little bit deeper. God may have given you a little bit of curiosity to engage in this given conversation or that given conversation. But make no mistake if verse 18 is true and God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be, that means that you have something distinctive to give. And in every encounter, God has a blessing for you to receive. And so these principles of relationships, we are interconnected and we do have a divine contribution. And everyone else has a divine contribution for us. And so then we move on to the next part, you know, which gets a little more challenging. And the next part reminds us that if we are interconnected and if God has designed us all to, you know, to be giving gifts for one another, we cannot indulge in the fantasy of, oh, if only I didn't have to deal with these people. If, it, if only it weren't for them. You know, the, that person, they're really the problem. If I didn't have them to deal with, everything would just be fine. That's not how this works. We don't get the fan to, to indulge in the fantasy of, well, if they're the problem, I just don't need them in my life anymore. No, we are interconnected, and we are God's gifts. Now, before I dig further into this, let me give a... a, a, a caveat for a moment. What I'm not talking about is cases of abuse or danger. If someone is harming you, if someone is causing physical harm, serious emotional harm, there is a case for, yes, you need to get out of that situation. You need, for, for, you know, you need to put boundaries around that, okay? I'm not saying to someone who's being abused, oh, don't get out of the relationship because you're, you know, God has placed them in your lives for one another. There, you know, there are places where immense harm is happening, and yes, you do need to be separated out from that person. That's not what I think this is talking about. I think that this sense of not having the luxury of getting rid of people, let's apply it more to the practicalities of the irritating person. The person who just gets on your nerves, not harming you per se, but just as a pain in the keister. You know that person where you just kind of roll your eyes when you know you're gonna have to encounter them. And believe me, 
I know this. You've got one of those people in your lives, or a couple. We all do. And believe me, I know this. You're one of those people to somebody. <laughs> and believe me, I know this. I'm one of those people <laughs> to any number of somebodies. That's just who we are. We, that's why this is in here. Because, yeah, we're going to grate on one another. We're going to irritate one another. But you can't say, I don't need you. And now, now, this particular passage, uh, beyond the irritating, it identifies three very specific types of people that it's very easy to say, oh, we have no need of them. Uh, one of those, so, so, so we get the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now, the, the way I read this, you know, here we are, we're, we're a meritocracy, you know, the people, the high performers, the achievers, and, and the folks who just fall behind, the folks that are physically frail, the folks that are um, just not able to keep up. Sometimes it's the elderly in our society. You know, we just shunt them off to a little gated community so we don't have to deal with them, so we can keep moving forward. It can be any number of cases of, of the, the, you know, the physically infirm, um, folks that you know, just have physical uh, impairments of some kind or form. Um, and yet, it, it's very easy just to kind of shunt them off to the side. And yet, here, no, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker, they're indispensable. Isn't that powerful? The parts that in a meritocracy, we would just kind of, you know, survival of the fittest, y'all. No, those people are indispensable. The weak, the frail, the infirm, indispensable. They have a gift we need. And God is reminding us, you don't have the luxury of saying, I have no need of you. The next piece, the parts we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. I've puzzled over that one as my best crack at this. This is my best take. Um, that, that when it's talking about the parts we think are less honorable, those are the, the folks that are marginalized by, you know, in any given society, there's always some group on the fringes that, that people have disdain for. And I think that's, that's the key thing, the, the, the feeling of disdain. You know, the, 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 that, that feeling of, if only those people. In, in any given society, it may be one group or another or one category of people or another, but when, when you feel that sense of contempt or disdain, and yet here it says the parts we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. That feeling of contempt, that feeling of disdain is a call, is, 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 is an inner call. I need to go above and beyond to recognize the dignity of that person, to recognize they have a gift for me. Now, I don't know who that is for you. Uh, you know, we, we live in a pretty free and open society you know, with lots of different folks going around. It may be people that you know, just have different approaches to achievement or accomplishment and ambition. It may be someone of a different political persuasion. It may be someone from a different region of the country. I don't know. But that feeling of contempt, that feeling of disdain, that's, I think, my best read, the trigger to say, no, this is where I need to be exerting some extra special effort to honor the dignity and the divine creation of that person. And then we get that last part, the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. I'll be honest, this one's a head scratcher for me. I've been trying to figure, figure this one out for a long time. Um, I had a counseling teacher in seminary. You know, he understood this to perhaps be, be people with mental illness, people that are just kind of scary, uh, you know, he was saying. She just don't know what to do, how to handle. Um, it could be people dealing with serious addiction issues. 
I, you know, I don't know, but you know, this idea of unpresentableness, you know, of putting boundaries around it, I think, is what's going on with that, that special, um, special modesty. This idea of structuring things in such a way that we can still honor uh, these folks as bearers of God's divine image, but not let chaos overwhelm us. That's, that's, that's my best take. But again, I tread cautiously on this because it is a, a, you know, a difficult passage. So, so all of that to say, we just don't have the luxury by God's word of saying, I have no need of these people. Uh, so all of that, you know, this, these principles that I think we can extract in this passage apply specifically to the church, but I do think these are general relationship principles. We are interconnected. Every human being bears God's image and has a contribution, and you have a contribution for them, and we don't have this luxury to, to uh, not deal with folks. But as we bring this to a close, there is that last verse. And I think that this last verse gives us a little bit of hope and gives us a little bit of picture, a, a picture of, of what that divine interconnectedness looks like. There in verse 26, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. And I think that's so lovely. Because it's this, this idea of interconnectedness is not just about, well, how do you behave and, you know, how are we affecting one another? But growing to the place that the Holy Spirit is growing us to the place of compassion. I mean, that's, that's what's going on in verse 26, right? Compassion. We feel for one another. We cry with one another. We laugh with one another. We rejoice with one another. When you've, when you've experienced it from someone else, it's wonderful, isn't it? Where you just talk to someone and unburden yourself, and they give you the space to unburden yourself, and they join with you, and it feels wonderful, that sense of connection that somebody understands and knows, and that is what God is growing within us through this interconnectedness. To have compassion for one another. And so, brothers and sisters, as we head forward to these next several messages about the people that God provides in our lives, may, may these principles come to mind and help alleviate the loneliness we may feel. You think about that. Amen.
now, brothers and sisters, go in grace, go in mercy, go in peace. May the living Lord Jesus Christ go with you. May he go above you to watch over you, behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, within you to give you peace, and before you to show you the way, both now and forevermore. Amen.